Hello everyone and welcome to lecture 3-4. We're continuing upon that theme of functional regions of the spinal cord. And in this lecture we'll be uh, focusing on the motor systems of the spinal cord. And so we can uh, divide these systems up many ways, but one way is based on conscious versus non-conscious motor systems. The conscious systems those systems have a two-neuron chain which always begins in the cortex. We consciously control things within the cortex of our brain. So that upper motor neuron in the cortex is going to send an axon through these white matter tracts to a lower motor neuron in the anterior gray matter of the spinal cord. A non-conscious motor system is going to have its upper motor neuron residing within a brainstem nucleus. Uh, and we'll see examples of that in the tectospinal and vestibular, uh, vestibular tracts. Um, <clears throat> so we've seen this picture before, uh, moving on to this diagram that we started to fill in in the previous lecture. Uh, so now we can see uh, this slide again, but I'm adding to this slide uh, in terms of letting you know that these white matter tracts are actually somatotopically organized within the spinal cord. So we have the lateral corticospinal tract here, and um, it controls appendicular uh, muscles, appendicular skeletal muscles via conscious motor control originating in the cortex. But the uh, regions of the, the, the cervical muscles uh, that, so this upper motor neuron tract is going to synapse on a lower motor neuron in different regions of the spinal cord. So it will synapse on a uh, cervical lower motor neuron, a thoracic lower motor neuron, a lumbar and a sacral lower motor neuron. And the uh, cervical fibers within this larger tract are located more medially. And as we get farther down in the body, uh, those uh, neurons are located more laterally. So if you um, bring this concept one step further, you'll uh, realize that as we go down through the spinal cord to a lower level, this corticospinal tract is going to shrink in size because the cervical and the thoracic uh, fibers will already be given off by the time we get to the lumbar spinal segment. This holds true also for the anterior corticospinal tract, which is responsible for the axial uh, muscles. And there are fewer axial muscles, so the anterior corticospinal tract is smaller. It is likewise somatotopically organized so that the cervical uh, fibers are closest uh, to the center and the sacral fibers are closest to the anterior, uh, to the uh, perimeter of the spinal cord. Now the rubrospinal tract is an exception to the rule about, uh, excuse me, conscious motor um, neurons. The rubrospinal tract is considered to originate in the red nucleus in the midbrain. So the red nucleus, uh, controls some of the appendicular muscle fibers, especially of the upper limb. Uh, however, the rubrospinal tract does get innervation from up upper motor neurons. So it's kind of, uh, it, it kind of breaks the rule. <clears throat> then of course we have the vestibular spinal tracts and the tectospinal tract here. So the, um, when, when I was in graduate school, I actually had brainstem sections and I had to identify by looking at this, the outline of these different tracts, both the motor and the sensory. Uh, so you can see the difficulty in doing that here. Where exactly does the vestibulospinals uh, end and the uh, corticospinals begin? Where exactly is the tectospinal tract so with a trained eye, you can make out these different uh, portions of the spinal cord, um, but that takes a histologist. I am not asking you to do that, but um, just I want you to appreciate uh, 
the amount of effort and work that went into uh, finding these different regions of the spinal cord. And they were found in a number of different ways. One way was the histological method where looking at these different uh, regions of the white matter, seeing a different concentration of axons that have a, have a different uh, thickness of myelination, making them a different type of axon. Um, and looking at the concentrations, uh, the densities of these axons within different regions. Also, through um, clinical means, a patient has a thrombus or an embolism uh, that results in uh, injury to these different portions of the spinal cord and then correlating that injury with the deficit that they elicit. So all of that information over the last 160 years, 150 years, uh, has culminated in the knowledge that we now have today. And these... Um, Experiments continue. We are finding new, more detailed uh, information about these different regions and um, learning about uh, you know, the different variances and the gradient that is biology and how these uh, regions are distinct and how they might overlap. So within the gross brain, uh, there are two different uh, primary cortices that we're going to be talking about in this uh, portion of the lectures. The first is the primary motor cortex. The second is the um, primary sensory cortex. So these regions span anterior and posterior to the central sulcus of the brain. So in this lecture, we'll be focusing on the tracts that begin in the um, primary motor cortex, the upper motor neurons and the conscious tracts. So uh, these, these conscious motor neurons begin in the primary motor cortex, descend through this white matter just below those cortical layers called the corona radiata uh, to travel through what's known as the internal capsule, particularly the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Uh, now, these structures are going to make more sense as we go through the course, but we have to start at some level, and this is where we're starting. So, these upper motor neurons travel through the internal capsule, through the midbrain, pons, and into the medulla. And in the medulla, they cross at the decusation of the uh, pyramids. <clears throat> so, uh, within the cortex... The cortex is composed of a number of different layers. Uh, so there are five layers, uh, distinct layers, and they have specific names uh, based on the contents of those layers. This slide we'll get more and more detail about, but right now just realize that upper motor neurons uh, reside in the fifth layer and they are called pyramidal cells or pyramidal neurons. These pyramidal neurons uh, project to uh, or project below the brain, project down to um, brainstem nuclei or project down into the spinal cord itself. You may hear the term Betz cells, B-E-T-Z, the uh, Pyramidal neurons are also known as Betz cells. These are some of the largest cells in the human body. Some of them are so large uh, that if you uh, took a section through the brain, through the primary motor cortex, you could actually see these cells with the naked eye without a microscope. And so the larger the cell, the longer the axon can be, the farther away the muscle fiber is uh, that that neuron can innervate. <clears throat> so, uh, here, let's take a look at these different tracts so you can read this information. <clears throat> so this slide here begins the information about the corticospinal tract, the first conscious motor tract. I'm showing you here uh, the name of the tract, that it's a conscious uh, tract, and it is a two-neuron chain. It has an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron, and we'll cover the path of both of those. So we see here on the right different sections through the brain, the forebrain, down into the brainstem, the midbrain, the pons, uh, 
Next, we'll go down into the medulla and the brain st and the, uh, the uh, spinal cord. On the left, I'm showing you so uh, each region, uh, each important part of this tract is numbered with an arrow pointing to uh, that region. And on the left, you can see that fiber, that axon, is traveling through those different regions. So region number one, uh, all of those upper motor neuron uh, fibers converge in the white matter just deep to the cortical layers, uh, and that is called the corona radiata. Next, they travel through the internal capsule in the forebrain. Uh, following that, they form what's called the crus cerebri in the uh, uh, cerebral peduncle of the midbrain. Uh, and then they continue through the pons. <clears throat> in the medulla, those fibers come together to form what's called the pyramids. The pyramids are visible on the anterior brainstem. You can actually see the bump that these fibers make, and we'll show you in a later slide. Uh, at this point, 90% of the fibers cross in the pyramids, in the medulla. Those 90% cross to the other side and descend as the lateral corticospinal tracts. The other 10% continue through the pyramids to form the anterior corticospinal tract. <clears throat> the anterior corticospinal tract remains uncrossed until it gets to the spinal cord level where it's going to innervate a lower motor neuron. <clears throat> at that point, at point eight, the anterior corticospinal tract is going to cross in the anterior white commissure at the level of the spinal cord where it innervates. <clears throat> the lateral corticospinal tract has already crossed in the pyramids. So um, in this way, the right primary motor cortex innervates the left side of the body because eventually all of these fibers cross. <clears throat> so here we can see an anterior view of the brainstem. Here's the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. I've highlighted the path that, this, uh, that these upper motor neuron axons take through the cerebral peduncles, through the pons, and forming the pyramids here you can also actually see the pyramidal decusation as it crosses, uh, as these pyramids merge briefly, as these fibers cross. You can actually physically see this on the brainstem. <clears throat> so these fibers, uh, once they reach the uh, lower motor neuron, what we'll see is that uh, they synapse on the lower motor neuron for the agonistic muscle. But not shown here, shown in some later slides, is that it also has collateral fibers that innervate an interneuron in uh, lamina, uh, lamina 6 of the spinal cord. These interneurons are inhibitory neurons, and they inhibit the antagonistic muscle. So all of these upper motor neurons, as you activate, for instance, your, your brachius, uh, brachialis muscle, you also have to inhibit your triceps brachii. Uh, otherwise, that muscle tension between the agonistic and antagonistic muscle would, um, would make the muscle action inefficient, it would use extra energy, and it would reduce the overall strength of the movement. So here we can see the rubrospinal tract. Uh, this spinal tract is named after the red nucleus. That's the rubro part. Uh, and the spinal part is the lower motor neuron. So here in this slide, you can see that path that the rubrospinal cord takes, uh, rubrospinal tract takes to the lower motor neuron. What's not mentioned here is that this is a um, conscious tract. So there is an upper motor neuron that comes down and synapses on the red nucleus. Uh, so it can technically be considered a three neuron chain if you include the cortical upper motor neuron. So uh, review how the fiber travels and uh, you can do that on your own. 
Here is the tectospinal tract in blue on these slides, beginning in the superior colliculus. This is an unconscious tract. Uh, traveling through the uh, MLF down to the, um, the interneuron and then the, uh, the lamina 9 lower motor neuron. So tectospinal tract is responsible for reflexive gaze. When something flies into your peripheral vision and your eyes automatically snap to it, that's the tectospinal tract unconsciously moving your eyes to detect that new bit of information that has suddenly appeared. So that's the role of the tectospinal tract. Here we have the vestibulospinal tracts, uh, the medial vestibulospinal tract in red and the uh, lateral vestibulospinal tract in blue. Uh, so first covering the medial vestibulospinal tract named after the medial vestibular nucleus at which it starts. So this um, uh, medial vestibulospinal tract will uh, immediately split uh, and one crossing fiber, one uncrossing fiber will go down uh, into the cervical spinal cord and modulate uh, the neck musculature to maintain your head balance on your neck as you're moving. So if you've ever seen a chicken uh, move as it's, you know, uh, walking around, it's its head, it bobs its head forward as it's moving. And it does this for a very particular reason. It's, uh, that movement is regulated by the chicken's medial vestibulospinal tract. And it's doing that because that uh, fixes its visual field uh, for a maximum amount of time before it has to snap its head forward. And it does this because uh, the chicken's eyes are very good at detecting motion. And so the chicken is going around hunting for bugs flying through its visual field. So it's using its medial vestibular spinal tract to keep the head stationary as it's moving as much as possible so that it can see bugs flying into its vestibular spinal tract. And then its tectospinal tract will zero in on that bug and it'll go and uh, uh, eat the bug. So very important mechanism for the chicken. Uh, also important for us as we regulate our bipedal motion. Uh, the uh, lateral vestibulospinal tract is going to be responsible for postural changes uh, throughout the rest of our body instead of just the neck. Uh, but same uh, you know, functional uh, purpose but just for the rest of the body. And you can see that medial vestibulospinal tract uh, traveling down uh, and it is an uncrossed uh, tract. So uh, it originates in uh, one side of the body, it stays in that side of the body, unlike the uh, medial vestibulospinal tract. <clears throat> so now let's talk about these lower motor neurons. Uh, lower motor neurons present in the anterior horn of the spinal cord, uh, and they exit out through the anterior rootlets so here I'm showing you in red on this image, the uh, red uh, lower motor neuron exiting out through the anterior rootlets, joining with the spinal nerve uh, after the uh, dorsal root ganglion, also called the spinal ganglion. And then it will exit out through either the anterior or posterior rami to innervate the muscles. So that's the tract that the lower spine or the tract that the lower motor neuron takes. In terms of um, the lower uh, motor neuron and its relation to the reflex arc, the lower motor neuron is, has to be innervated by some sensation in order to activate a reflex arc. Uh, so this happens via the sensory neurons that are entering the spinal cord via the dorsal rootlets. So the... Um, location of the cell body of origin for the, uh, for the sensory neurons is the dorsal root ganglion. That, so I am a sensory neuron. I am located in the dorsal root ganglion. I have a peripheral fiber uh, 
that goes out to sense some part of the body. And I have a central fiber that goes in through the dorsal rootlets to synapse on maybe the nucleus proprius. So think of that dorsal root ganglion as that uh, bipolar neuron branching out in both directions. So there might be a, a muscle spindle uh, fiber uh, that this peripheral branch is sensing. And when that muscle is stretched, it sends that information to the uh, anterior horn and to an interneuron to cause that reflex arc. So here we have the uh, patellar uh, ligament test where using a hammer to hit the uh, patellar ligament and that causes an extension of the leg. And so that's how that reflex arc works and it again has uh, sensory fibers that collateralize on an interneuron to inhibit the antagonistic muscle as you can see on this diagram. So how can we use this information in a diagnostic way? That's the question. So what would happen if we had a lesion of the uh, lower motor neuron? So a lesion of the lower motor neuron would mean that this uh, lower motor neuron here in the anterior horn is not present, which would mean that there's nothing to innervate the muscles during a reflex arc. So these muscles are going to be under flaccid paralysis, <clears throat> most likely, and um, this reflex arc will be severed. So if you perform, uh, for instance, a ligament test or a tendon test on a uh, limb muscle, if the lower motor neuron is damaged, you will receive no uh, reflex from that muscle that you've tested. If the damage is in the upper motor neuron, that reflex arc is going to be intact and you will get that reflex, but the patient will probably not, will not have conscious control over that muscle or might have um, uh, weakness, uh, varying degrees of weakness, depending on how many lower motor neurons have been damaged or how many upper motor neurons have been damaged in this case. So what happens with an upper motor neuron lesion? So in this case, uh, the reflex will still occur uh, because you have an intact lower motor neuron reflex arc, but the patient won't have uh, a conscious control over that muscle. So one test to test for the uh, upper motor neuron damage is called the Babinski sign. So a positive Babinski sign is shown here on the right. So in the Babinski test, you take a um, pointed object on the bottom of the foot, on the heel of the foot, poke that and drag it forward, and um, that will cause a reaction in the patient. A patient with an intact, conscious upper motor neuron system will uh, curl their toes downward and uh, you know, jerk their foot away from this pointed thing dragging on the bottom of their foot. However, a patient with um, a, an upper motor neuron lesion will uh, still have an intact lower motor arc, which will result in the toes fanning away, uh, fanning, uh, dorsiflecting, uh, like so. So the, the dorsiflexion of the toes is called a positive Babinski sign. If a patient has a positive Babinski sign, then uh, they have a upper motor neuron lesion. And it's interesting, uh, babies actually exhibit positive Babinski sign, uh, uh, you know, up until, you know, their first year or so. Uh, and that's because their lower motor neuron uh, has innervated the musculature, but the upper motor neuron is still developing and, and finding its way down the spinal cord to the lower motor neuron. Uh, so babies uh, will have a uh, positive Babinski sign until that connection occurs. So if anybody has any babies at home, you can test that out. So that's it for this lecture. Thanks for listening.